All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is D.P. Layton. I am the Assistant Director for Creative Careers. I am joined today by my career here, Verissa. Hello. I want to say hi, Verissa. So Verissa and I today are going to be talking to you guys about networking for artists and creatives. So the first more, most important question to ask yourself is why is networking important? Why are you doing this thing? Um, and the answer to that is that 85% of jobs are filled through employee referrals. The more connections you have, the better opportunities that you're going to find. Another important aspect of networking is being able to get information, insider information, into your field. As we all know, in the arts, design, and performance realm, each industry is a little bit unique and has some quirks to it, different lingo, and that's true with many careers, but especially in creative careers, each niche kind of has its own unique world, and networking is so valuable to get insider information onto that world, uh, as well as getting uh, tips and tricks from the pros who are doing it themselves. But more importantly, 85% of jobs are filled through networking. So it's very important to have a network and not just that, but to sustain that network throughout your time. So again, we talked about the benefits of networking, uh, opportunity that you'll find for uh, jobs potentially, um, connecting with like-minded people, being able to learn a little bit more about your career and also explore different facets of your career, different uh, employment opportunities, different jobs that you might not have otherwise thought about. So networking is another great way for finding awesome people. Now, you might be asking yourself, um, how do I network and, and what does networking really mean? It seems like this big corporate term of you know, people with suits and ties on and how, how does a creative, how does an artist uh, tackle something so corporately minded? Well, communicating is networking. Networking happens everywhere. Um, Communicating and networking is basically, it's interacting with people and getting information from one another. And you're already doing this, likely. Uh, networking can happen with faculty and staff, uh, with alumni from ASU, uh, industry professionals who might not be connected to your education or connected to your inner circle right now, um, the community around you who you might not think uh, would be related to your career field in the future, but really are. And of course, your peers, the people sitting next to you in your classes, the people eating lunch with you, uh, the people on Zoom calls with you during this time. Um, all of these are opportunities and people that you can network with and many, many more. Um, people often think, uh, people get caught up on the peer section of this and how do I network with like classmates and, and what does that mean? What does that look like? The important thing to remember is contrary to popular belief, the people who are sitting next to you in class, the people who you are in school with, these are not your competition going out into the career field. This is, these are your lifelines. These are, this is your support network. This is, uh, these are your friends, your colleagues, uh, your future coworkers uh, in these fields. You are working together to build it. And one great thing about networking with your peers is that you can build your own network. Once you find uh, a friend of yours who might be connected to someone else, you might be able to get connected to them as well. So where can I network? The opportunities are limitless. Um, from career fairs and alumni events uh, to associations and, uh, and different employer-hosted events, there's so many opportunities especially for artists, going to things like gallery shows and museums and performances, networking with people who are mingling around or at certain areas. Um, it's not just the corporate world of going to a professional development seminar and exchanging business cards. Networking can really happen anywhere and especially for ASU students. There's so many opportunities on campus, such as, again, these career fairs and professional mixers and alumni events that you are invited to, as well as different, uh, more niche opportunities within your own school, within your own academic departments um, to network and to branch out. And again, online, very important online, especially uh, with uh, the social distancing mandates that we're experiencing right now. Uh, networking uh, now is actually more vital than ever, but also easier than ever because everyone is just 
glued to their phone, stuck at home. Uh, there's really no excuse for not being able to answer a phone call or an email right now. So now is actually the great time uh, to reach out and to start building uh, that really awesome network. So there are different options for starting online. There's uh, Handshake, of course. Uh, hopefully you all have a Handshake profile already. Um, LinkedIn.com is a wonderful resource as well. Uh, LinkedIn has over 385 thousand ASU alumni on our alumni page. So it's a really wonderful place to get started and build that network and find people who maybe graduated with your same degree or in a career field that you're really interested in or at a company uh, that you you're, have your eye on. Um, another opportunity is the ASU Mentor Network, which is, linked, which is ASU's uh, call to LinkedIn. The ASU Mentor Network is populated by industry professionals uh, ASU staff and alumni who have specifically raised their hand to give back to ASU students. They've said, I want to help out. I want to be a mentor. Important thing to remember is that LinkedIn's response rate is anywhere between 10 and 20%, we find. The ASU Mentor Network response rate is about 80 or 90%. You're almost guaranteed to get a response back on the ASU Mentor Network, whereas LinkedIn, you're going to have to cast a wider net. Um, there's also different other uh, opportunities like meetup.com, network after work, um, things like that, as well as, of course, our alumni association and other professional associations. My background is in photography. Uh, and so when I was a student, I joined the Society for Photographic Education, which was a national organization. I met so many wonderful people in that organization. I had an opportunity to go to a national convention with them and interact in person. And I got so many wonderful uh, tips and insights networking through that association. And there are many associations too, if you are pressed for cash, that are also free. Um, as well as those professional associations, there are also professional associations in ASU that you can join depending on your craft, depending on your academic unit, you can find those opportunities right in your own backyard at ASU. So how do we start networking? How do you break the ice? If you're like me, you're kind of nervous around new people, don't really know how to, how to start the conversation. Um, so these are some three great steps, easy steps to start that. So you start with crafting a powerful introduction that starts before you even uh, press send or you get to uh, the event that you're going to. Um, you're going to prepare for an informational interview. So after you already make an, a connection with the person, you're going to prepare to, to leverage that network, to use that network, to use that person and uh, build a connection there. Um, and then you're going to establish an online presence and, an on, uh, and a continuous revitalization of your network. You're going you're gonna to water that garden. You're not just going to plant the flowers once and let them die. You're going to have to keep coming back and tending to that garden. So telling your story, telling other people you're awesome, this can be nerve wracking. Believe me, I get it. I was a student and I felt just as nervous. The thing I always love to tell people, especially in the creative industry, is that we were all nervous. And in fact, we still are. I lovingly say we are all two toddlers in a trench coat just trying to survive in this world. Everyone's nervous, everyone's anxious, everyone has a little bit of anxiety. And it's important just to keep in mind that the person that you're networking with was in your shoes, or they currently are. Um, so that kind of takes some of the anxiety off of it, um, just being able to break the ice, knowing that uh, they're not better than you, and you're not worse than them, they are established in a field that you, are, that you will be too, and it's just a matter of time, and they were exactly where you were, and they had to start networking as well. So here are my tips on crafting a powerful introduction. We want to start with our interests. We want to start with our commonality. I had a professor one time who said uh, about creative writing, the more personal, the more universal, and that's very, very true with networking. When you start off from a personal standpoint and a, and a, and a source of uh, relatability with someone in your network, it's gonna be the best way uh, to break the ice. They're passionate about what they do and you are too. And so starting with that passion, starting with that commonality of we both went to ASU or we're both in graphic design or you know, 
uh, I want to work for that for the company that you're at as well. Those are great ways that passion and that interest of commonality to start with. Um, after you kind of establish your interests really quickly, you're also going to want to talk about your experience. Maybe some of your experiences match up with theirs. Um, but you're going to want to discuss how, where you've been so far, and that'll help the person who, who you're reaching out to or you're talking to know a little bit about where you're coming from and how to approach this conversation. You're going to want to talk about your strengths, your skills, and your competencies. Um, this might seem kind of like a pitch, but really everything uh, in life it can be summarized down to the strategies of making a pitch. Um, and last, you're going to want to talk about what you're looking for. You're going to want to end that email or that conversation or that, that initial pitch to that person uh, with, I, I, you know, I'd love to take some more time to speak with you. I'd love to get your business card. I'm interested in learning more. Um, whatever you're looking for, uh, you want to make sure that's known and you're not just leaving this as an open-ended, awkward conversation. Uh, this is a really great graphic that I like showing people. <clears throat> And it's kind of the everlasting gobstopper of why, how, what, where at the outside is the what. Um, everyone in the world knows what they're doing. Every organization knows what they're doing. Every company knows what they do, what they make, what they teach. Some people know how. Uh, many people uh, know how they're getting across it. Few people really give a lot of time to why. Now, that's not the case with creatives. We actually find that creatives go from the inside out. And that's how a lot of times they, we operate as artists, as creatives, uh, individuals. Um, you are watching this. The what is you're watching this recorded video. The how is you're doing that with your eyes. You're listening with your ears or you're reading the transcript. But why? Why are you here? Why did you join us? <clears throat> why do you care about networking? The why is very important. The why you're passionate about what you do is where you want to come from. <clears throat> so why, how, what, that's a good way to start structuring it. Why do you do the things that you do? Then you start on how, how do you do it? What are your, uh, what are, what's your education? What's your background? What's your, uh, what's your how? you do. And then what is, what are you bringing to the table? Uh, what are you looking for? What are you after? What's the point of all of this? So start with all that. Because if you start with the, with the what of, I want this thing, it comes off as needy rather than a, starting with the why comes off as a, as an organic conversation. So your powerful introduction to someone in your new network starts with your why, showcase your how, and explain your what then you're gonna to wanna to try and write it down. Um, so obviously if this is in person, you wanna be off book. You don't wanna be going up to them with a note card and reading off of that to a person. You wanna make sure that you've somewhat memorized this. You wanna practice it again, but still be human. Uh, and when you are writing an email, again, you don't just want this to be a form letter that looks like some weird Mad Lib where you're just replacing the person's name and industry and company. You really want this to be an organic uh, situation. And the best way to do that is by uh, preparing to say it in 30 seconds uh, without notes and practicing it. Practicing with uh, friends and family and better yet, practicing with people who might not know you that well uh, because they'll give you honest feedback about how you're coming across in this conversation or an email. Uh, before you send off those emails, maybe run it by a friend just to see kind of what they think of it or ask a professor or an instructor to take a look at it. Or you can even come to Creative Career Services and make an appointment and we can help you with that. <clears throat> so informational interviewing uh, is a very important process. So I'm actually going to turn it over to my peer, Verissa, to answer this question. What do you know about informational interviewing and why is it important, Verissa? Yeah, so informational interviewing is basically where you go to someone who you kind of, I wouldn't, I guess kind of look up to, but mostly like is in the profession that you want to be a part of during the career that you want. And you do it so you kind of figure out before you um, jump into it or before you have the experience, you know, would this be a right fit for me? Or yeah, you know you want to do that uh, career, but maybe what do I do starting now, kind of getting into it? So just 
it's interviewing someone with a goal that you want and kind of kind of picking at their brain so you could ask them uh anything you want um but mostly nothing like personal it's for your career and career interests so uh, it's usually the people are usually a lot more helpful and wanting to help you more than you think so it's always a good thing to have these and kind of give your kind of give you more information on how to be within your career so exactly yeah and i know varissa's actually done a number of informational interviews uh, within our office learning a little bit about different industries uh, different trends and what's going on um, so as we see here, informational interviewing is, is just that. It's, it's interviewing for information. It's not interviewing for a job. Uh, you're, it's, it's more of a friendly conversation with someone to get a little bit more information. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's watering that network. It's not just clicking connect and friending them and getting a business card. It's facilitating that relationship and nurturing it and uh, making sure that they know who you are and that you care. And then you are using them to the best of your ability to get um, uh, more information. So uh, it can be kind of daunting to try and start this conversation. Uh, Varissa and I recommend that you choose maybe about two or three of the topics that we see here uh, to start with an informational interview. Now, info interviewing can be in person over a cup of coffee. Uh, it can be on the phone or on Zoom. And it can also be in the form of an email or a uh, messaging chain, you know, like on LinkedIn. Um, but these are some of the common questions that are asked and really important things. So um, obviously industry specifics we talked about um, and different tips for starting out in your industry. But some things that uh, people very often miss on informational interviewing are things like uh, job titles, asking people in your industry you know, for instance, let's take uh, architecture. Outside of being an architect, what are some other job titles? What are some introductory positions? Um, what are some organizations uh, that we should be looking at? Um, because the person who you're likely talking to started out at the bottom and worked their way up. So you can ask them, what were some of the jobs you had? And also in your firm, in your company, what are some of the introductory job titles that you're seeing right now? Um, but one of the most important things uh, on this page, and that's why it, it takes up the most space, is the question, what haven't I asked and what else would you like to tell me? Those are very important questions to ask because, as Marissa said, people are actually a lot friendlier than you might assume, um, but they also have an end game. They have a reason that they connected with you. They have a reason that they're being so friendly and wanting to, uh, to connect and give you information. They have a story to tell. Likely the reason that they chose to meet with you is because they had a particular kernel of wisdom they wanted to give to you. And it's very important when you're wrapping up a conversation to ask these questions so that A, you can get information that maybe you didn't think about but B, you're just being a good person, a nice person, um, and being mindful of the fact that uh, maybe you didn't ask the types of questions that this person wanted to ask. First, I'm wondering, when you've been doing informational interviews, what are some of the topics that have come up uh, when asking professionals these sort, uh, this final question? A lot of people actually, they offer like resources that help them and it's not necessarily like professional for example oh this book that i just thought about um while having this conversation was definitely crucial for like changing my mindset or helping me think this way about my career so that often comes about so things like that that are also really helpful yeah a lot of different things can come up that you're not really expecting when you're when you're uh, fostering these networks and doing these informational interviews. Now, these are all great questions to ask and great topics, but there are some big topics to avoid. Uh, Varissa touched on some of these. Um, the big one is asking for a job. You never want to start a communication with a new uh, person in your network by asking them for a job. Uh, if they are an employer, uh, if this is someone who you're applying to, then you want to build that network after you've gone through the interview process. Um, but 
you can't really build, uh, you can't really foster that network if you're actively applying to a job that they have, because very often it's a conflict of interest. And very often in most companies, uh, there are uh, human resource regulations that prevent them from being able to ask that. I will give this a caveat and say that it is very important in an interview process to follow up, just like a network, with people who you interviewed with. Um, I know when I was hiring on Barissa, she uh, reached out to me with a very nice email thanking me for my time. Um, however, that's not really networking. Uh, that's just kind of building trust and, um, and uh, being good at your interview strategy. The next thing is talking over or cutting off people. Um, very often, especially depending on your industry, you'll get a chatterbox. You'll get someone who's just going on and on. Um, it's really important to uh, make sure that you are uh, communicating your interest in this relationship that you're building and you don't want to cut them off, talk over them, or change the topic rapidly. Even though they might not be talking about the thing that's most pressing on your mind, as Verissa said, they have a narrative and they might have a really great kernel of knowledge or a recommendation uh, that could be great for you and you can't get to that if you're talking over them. Uh, again, demanding anything, so not just a, a job, but like, uh, I've heard some weird things with networking. Look, you know, asking for a place to stay when you're traveling places, never ask to stay with someone. If they offer that, fine, but um, never ask for someone where to stay or like for food or resources, things of that nature um, can leave a bad taste in someone's mouth and you come across as less professional. Um, uh, really anything demanding uh, more of their time than is appropriate, uh, demanding a, uh, a letter of recommendation, things like that. These are all things that you can politely ask for a little later on, um, but especially in your first informational interview, you don't want to demand anything like that. And last, again, Marissa said, nothing too personal. This isn't a time to ask them about gossip or dirt on a certain company or someone in the industry or oh, I heard you worked for so-and-so, I heard that, you know, I heard they act this sort of way, tell me all about it. Um, they might get into gossip, but it's very important when you're making your first uh, impression on this person that you don't seem like the gossip type um, because word travels fast in creative communities. It might seem like a really big industry, but really the networking is very close-knit and people will find out, so. Next, I wanna talk about the online tools uh, and filters that you can be using for different uh, opportunities, uh, really to leverage your time online and not just be, again, just casting a wide net and not getting any fish. It's very important to build your online presence. So uh, if you have not already, we recommend you set up an ASU Mentor Network profile. This, again, we talked about it, this is ASU's version of LinkedIn. The response rate is a lot higher. Uh, you can customize your account a little bit more. Um, you can talk specifically about clubs and organizations in ASU. You can look for certain help topics. Um, basically, all the tools of LinkedIn and more are on this. One of the tools I really like using on ASU's mentor network uh, in the filters when you go to make a connection uh, is the help topics. These are help topics not just of uh, looking at my resume or uh, set up an informational interview. These are help topics like being a woman in engineering, being LGBTQ in the workplace, uh, managing a, a full-time job and a family, or balancing um, a graduate program and full-time work. Different type of help topics to where maybe you don't need someone who's specifically in the fashion industry to talk to you about having a family and going to school and working full-time. Um, that can really be covered by anyone who's kind of gone through that experience and build your network in a more unique way. Get a little bit exposure into different industries. Again, we've harped on it before. Very important, make sure that you have a LinkedIn profile. This is where most professionals go. When employers are researching you, they of course do use Handshake uh, through ASU, but they also use LinkedIn. Now, uh, I want to stress the importance of what we would call brand cohesion uh, in a design field. Uh, what that really means is making sure that uh, you, as an employable person, are uniform. So making sure that your handshake, your mentor network, your LinkedIn, and other profiles online all match. Use the same profile picture, write out the same job descriptions and the same, uh, same contact information. 
Uh, very often we find with international students, they have uh, a given name by their family and a chosen name uh, with their friends or their community here. You wanna make sure whichever one you're using that it's consistent upon all of the platforms. Uh, so making sure that if an employer is jumping from Mentor Network or Handshake and is going onto LinkedIn or is going onto Glassdoor, that when they look up your name, that it's the same person, especially if you have a very common name uh, that uh, many other people have, it's really important that they know who they're looking for. So that profile picture, if you have a common name, can really save you. Um, again, on LinkedIn, I really want to bring attention to the, uh, when you go and search in LinkedIn for ASU, Arizona State University, you can scroll down uh, on ASU's page and there's an alumni tab. And again, we have over 385,000 alumni from various industries and use those keyword searches and use those filters to the best of your ability. And we're going to go through some of those tools right now. So obviously keywords are the thing that come to mind the most. You're going to type in your major, you're going to type in a type of job you want. Um, but outside of those keywords, I always tell students the only way that you're going to learn about new job opportunities that maybe those job titles you haven't thought about before is by using the filters. The only way you're going to find people who uh, you might not have thought to connect with or network with before is by using these filters. So filter through their education. Where did they go to school? What did they study? What was their major? When did they graduate? You're also going to want to look at different things like where do they work? Uh, what industry are they in? So maybe they got a degree in fashion and design, but they work in sustainability right now. And that'd be a really interesting crossover and an opportunity for you to learn more about an industry that's very relevant to your degree. On top of that, you can look at uh, volunteer work in different, thing, uh, different locations that they volunteered that you might have in common, or you can see where they volunteered to give you a sense of where maybe you could get more uh, experience in your field. So all these are really wonderful different filters to use. And some of the best practices for this, uh, again, as I said, to complete a robust profile. First and foremost, you want to make sure you have that information on there, uh, not only so that these search engines populate the most relevant opportunities and information to you, so the most relevant alumni, uh, the most relevant job opportunities can only be surfaced if the algorithm in the computer knows what your major is, what year you are, uh, where you're looking to go work, what types of jobs you're interested in, what industry, yada, yada. Um, if you just have a blank profile, it won't know that. And also you're going to be uh, a lot more difficult to find. Just think of it this way. If you were right now looking for someone and there's a really great network that you have, there's a really great person you want to find and you can't find them through all the filters or keywords, that's a bummer. And so when you are getting out there into the industry, you want to make sure that you have all those filters so that if someone's trying to network with you, if a student's trying to get to where you are, you want to be able to be found. You want them to be able to, to get to you and talk to you. So complete that robust profile and cast a wide net. It's not just a matter of trying to connect with one person and hoping that that's going to be like your golden ticket to a successful career. You're going to want to talk to a lot of people. You're going to want to put a wide net out there. Also realizing that not everyone's going to have the time to reply and not everyone's going to reply immediately. Just because they don't reply in the next, you know, two days doesn't mean that they're never going to reply. Just might mean that they don't have time or they didn't see the message yet, but you're going to want to cast a wide net um, and you're going to take notes of what you find. Different places that people work in your industry, different job titles, uh, locations. Very often, especially in the film industry, people think that Los Angeles is the end all be all to the film industry and you will find on these different networks uh, that there are so many opportunities just here in Arizona and all over the country out and all over the world outside of Los Angeles. Now, many people do live in LA, but if you take LA out of the filter, you're still gonna find so many people that work in the film industry outside of just Los Angeles. So take note of where they're living, what companies they're doing, uh, they're working for, what job uh, titles they have, um, you're also going to want to research that individual. So before you click send, you're going to want to look at who they are, do a little bit of research outside of that platform so that when you're crafting that introduction, that email to them, that message to them, that it's a little bit more tailored. Now, the wonderful thing about ASU Mentor Network is that the Mentor Network has built into it a sample icebreaker message to people. 
So it's a really wonderful way to get started. If you don't really know how to start these pitches, if you're still awkward about it, uh, if you need a little bit more guidance, go to Mentor Network, click on Make a Connection, find someone you want to network with, and when you click to connect with them, it'll auto-populate some samples based on your profile of what you might want to ask them. Now, these are, again, a Mad Libs type thing where it's just auto-populating a computer. They sound really awkward and weird. Make them customize. And again, that's where the research comes into play. If I were networking with Barissa, I would say, hey, Barissa, I see that you're a painting major, but you're also really interested in uh, computer science and computer graphics. I too uh, am really interested in kind of combining my passions for visual design and painting with computers. I'm wondering if you had some time to talk with me or hey, Brissa, I see you just took a class last year with this one professor. I have them coming up. Uh, do, you, do you have time to talk and tell me a little bit more about their class? Researching a little bit more about Verissa is gonna make her more likely to respond than if I were to say, Verissa, you study at ASU. I study at ASU. Can I talk? you're gonna to wanna to build a little bit more personality in there. And then last, crafting a powerful but relatable introduction. So again, remember that they are all, uh, we are all awkward, we are all nervous very often, um, and you don't have to come at this with any sort of confidence. You can be nervous and you can call attention to that and say, hey, I'm really nervous to send this email, but uh, you seem like a great person I should know. And so I'm just gonna jump in feet first and ask if we can set up a time to talk. Now, we have stressed the importance thus far about following up, uh, keeping up with those awesome people and making sure that you're making the most out of your network. As we all know, when you're going to a career fair, you're not just getting their business card in order to uh, decoupage your wall. You are getting that business card so that you can follow up, so you can message people. Um, Farissa, do you know uh, how long we should give to follow up with a professional at a network? It's like 24 hours, right? Exactly, yeah, 24 to 48 hours. Now, uh, I always say if you are going to a career fair that's like on a, or a networking event that's like on a Friday night, by Monday morning, 8 a.m., when that person gets into the office or checks their emails, you want to make sure that they have an email from you ready to go. Uh, that's saying thank you, uh, that's checking in with them. When you do an informational interview, you're gonna wanna send that thank you note uh, within the next 24 hours. It can be right after, or it can be the next morning, that's fine. Um, but you're gonna, again, wanna make sure that you're following up with them, thanking them for their time, building that robust connection, and keep coming back to water that garden and build that. Right now, it's a really great time, uh, if you already have some people in your network, to reach out to them and say, hey, Hope everything's going well. I know that social distance mandates have been impacting a lot of industries. Wondering how you're faring with all that. How's your company doing? How are you as a freelance artist uh, working around some of these issues? Um, are there any insights to digital technology that you're learning now for your career that I should be thinking about? So building, uh, building that network and uh, keeping it up to date and keeping it growing uh, is very important to follow up with. Um, so yes, uh, you're not just networking for opportunities and referrals, um, it's a relationship. Um, and I'm, I, I hope that you don't, uh, that whether it's your family or your chosen family, you don't just call your family once a year uh, on a holiday to say, hey, but you follow up a little bit more frequently with your friends and family. So think of it as a new friend you're making. Um, so when you're following up, when you're talking with that person the first time, actively listen, ask questions. I have a little notebook that I keep by me um, that I write down and maybe I'll glue or staple in a business card and I'll write notes about that person or I'll keep them in my Rolodex for my email and ask some questions. Um, and I'm actively listening, I'm taking notes. Um, it's totally fine too uh, when you're speaking with someone new uh, to be taking notes. Uh, don't do it on your phone, Don't, because that looks like texting. Even if you convey to them like, hey, I'm not texting, I'm taking notes, it's still kind of awkward. You want to make sure you're, you're writing down, uh, and when you're on an interview with someone or you're Zooming or Skyping with someone, that you're doing it physically because typing can kind of look, again, like you're playing a game and not listening. Um, but you're going to use those notes for follow-up. You're going to say, hey, I remember you worked at this company, or hey, I remember your son just started, you know, uh, daycare. How's that going? How's your, you know, you and your husband are, uh, you know, off doing yada yada. 
following up with some personal information as well as the professional business information. Um, when you're meeting someone in person, don't rely on them reaching out to you. Yes, it's important to give them your business card, but it's even more important to get their business card. If they do not have a business card, make sure that you are taking notes on the correct spelling of their name, of their organization, and the correct spelling of their email and, their, and the correct numbers of their phone number. If they can't give you a business card, make sure you're getting that information down. I'll tell you how many times I've come from a career fair and people have emailed me being like, oh, who was it from Ewing Cole that showed up? I don't remember the guy's name. I didn't get his phone number. Just because they have their business card doesn't mean they're going to email you. You want to make sure you're getting that information so that you can network and build that network. Uh, and again, setting follow-up information, connecting on social media platforms like LinkedIn, very important. Blah, blah, blah. I have been speaking at you all for the better part of uh, 30 to 45 minutes now. Um, Varissa, I'm wondering, do you, as uh, both a career peer, uh, creative career peer, and as a student who is looking to go into some of these industries, have any feedback uh, on uh, networking and informational interviewing for artists and creatives? Well, I actually do have one thing. I had two, but I kind of forgot the second one, but I'll say the first one. Um, I would say definitely um, he mentions it, DP mentions it all the time that kind of promoting yourself is definitely a hard thing to do, but definitely starting to practice that now if you don't do it already and craft starting to craft your powerful introduction is very essential. Um, though we do have these events uh, featuring uh, networking, there's also times where it was just oh, I'm in line at the grocery store and someone took an interest and they're like, oh, you're an artist. Well, can I see your art? And I would, <laughs> I would be too shy to like show my own work. I've definitely grown out of that now, but um, just the little things like that, practicing um, advocating for yourself, your dreams um, is something that's very essential. And then I would say, um, uh, participate in the definitely participate in the networking events that we do have but not only like catering to you your subject but also look outside of your subject it might be beneficial I know I went to a I wasn't really prepared for it professionally I went with my friend to an event about healthcare and kind of working how we're trying to make it more global in the US but um uh, there was an event right after the panel and um you know scientists need artists too so uh just going to events outside of your special interests might be beneficial as well so things like that uh, I like that but networking in unlikely places is uh, definitely something that creatives and artists know very well and it's very important for their career field, so. Well, thank you all very much for your time. Uh, again, my name is DP Layton. I'm the Assistant Director for Creative Careers. My email is right there. Uh, I've been joined by the lovely Varissa Washington. Hello. So thank you all very much. And uh, make sure to make a Creative Careers appointment uh, or stop by the Creative Career Services in the Herberger office in Design South. Yeah, come and see us. <laughs>